So, Talmadge, that was wonderful, and you're right. We will all miss Ted. Uh, I'm here to offer a tribute to uh, Dr. Ted Eager, um, who passed away about a month ago. Uh, as mentioned here in the New York Times, this is a, a picture, and I think, Stu, you took this picture, correct? Yeah. By, by the way, we have to talk afterwards because I was frequently sort of teased because I was short back in elementary school, but <laughs> but here I was, but, and you introduced me as a short speaker, so I, you know these things. <laughs> I understand. I get it. Um, <laughs> no, no worries. Um, I've got, I got used to it a while back. Anyway, I'm off topic. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, it's interesting that this picture was chosen by the Times, the picture that you I think took. Um, because Ted also chose that for his autobiography, um, the autobiography of a persistent anesthesiologist. He started on this two years ago, and about a year ago, uh, I started work editing it. So uh, like uh, Talmadge provided here, where we heard from um, uh, Dr. Stanley in his own words, uh, we'll hear from Dr. Eager in his own words. He opens his autobiography just with a quote I was born about 10,000 years ago, and there ain't nothing in this world I don't know. I, know. I saw Peter, Paul, and Moses playing Ring Around the Roses and whip the guy that says it isn't so. Turns out Ted liked to sing, and he liked to sing folk songs, and so that's how he opens. I was born on September 3rd, 1930, in Michael Reese Hospital, Chicago, 84 years after Morton's 1846 discovery and demonstration of the anesthetic effects of diethyl ether. I arrived in life midway between today and that momentous discovery, a discovery that underlies my self-identity. At the time of my birth, anesthesia as a medical discipline had lived half its life, having changed modestly or not at all from the days of Wells, Morton, and Snow. Nitrous oxide and ether remain the primary general anesthetics. Anesthesia adjustments were based on the patient's response, as described in Snow's degrees of anesthesia, or Goodell's later signs and stages of anesthesia. Waters had just established the world's first department of anesthesiology. The half century that followed transformed anesthesia from an art into a scientific discipline. Ted's father, mother, and his uncle, Emil, a real rascal, who he referred to as the magician in my life. My parents could afford to send me to the Hyde Park School for Little Children at the age of three. I remember developing an intimate relationship with Dick and Jane dazzled by the connection between the language I spoke and the written word. My parents paid me a penny for each fly I caught in the house. Budding capitalist that I was, I used my first wages to purchase fly paper, vastly increasing my earnings. I caught flies in the house, mostly in the basement. When I and my fly paper exhausted that supply, I opened the basement door to the outside and diminished fly numbers in the backyard. At Charles Kaminsky Public Elementary School, I rapidly sank to the bottom of the class. I remained stuck in academic doldrums for a decade. I failed courses repeatedly. I could not describe the structure of a sentence. I failed to understand fractions. I did not comprehend science. I ended my first semester in junior high school with three Ds and an F. I seemed not to have the capacity for memorization that each class required. Despite the D in science, I liked chemistry. I also liked making explosives. I learned how to mix nitrates and sulfur to wondrous effect, pursuing experiments that might have destroyed our house. Checkers were among the sports offered. Sports. I, this timid weakling, short, <laughs> could win an athletic letter. I joined the checker enthusiasts, a distinct minority of the checker club members. I established myself as the best checker player in the club, becoming the captain of the vaunted Hyde Park High School checker team. Although my grades were dismal, I graduated in the bottom 20% of my class, I led the team that won the All Chicago Checker Championship, two years running. Epiphany of a shoe salesman. I had an epiphany in my junior year in high school. My buddy Ralph Fertig suggested we earn pocket money working at Malling Shoes, a low price store on the south side of Chicago catering mostly to poor black women. My first day I discovered women enjoy shoe shopping more than shoe buying. 
I helped many ladies enjoy the pleasure of trying on pairs of new footwear, but I didn't sell many shoes. My eight or 10 hours of work left me exhausted. Selling shoes was hard work for little money. If I didn't improve academically, I might spend my life at Mullings. My aha moment. After high school, I enrolled in Roosevelt College, the only college that accepted my poor grades. The summer before college, I prepared for the classes I would take, reading and rereading the required books. When school began, classes and studying became my life. I slept four to six hours a day, ate meals, and studied. I studied every day, including holidays. I was not a brilliant student, but I was a persistent one. Years later, I came across a marvelous comment on persistence by an average president, Calvin Coolidge. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The, furl, the world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent, which is why he chose to title his autobiography the autobiography of a persistent anesthesiologist. Good grades allowed me to transfer after one year to the University of Illinois. School and grades continued to be the purpose of my life. I was single-minded in purpose, driven by the carrot of a respected career and the stick of not wanting to shell shoes. There was no uplifting joy in learning. There was no transcend transcendental beauty of knowledge. It was just school and grades. I chose a major in chemistry and a minor in mathematics. I attended class 12 to 15 hours each day with an additional 8 to 12 hours of study after class. That adds up to more than 24 hours every day. <laughs> That's what it felt like. With good grades from the University of Illinois, I enrolled at Northwestern Medical School. My decision to pursue anesthesia as my life's work came suddenly in a single day in the summer between my first and second years at Northwestern. Before medical school, I envisioned becoming a general practitioner. I wanted to emulate Dr. Robert Koch, a country physician who had made great medical discoveries. But I changed my mind. Like many medical students, I switched to anesthesia for money and power. <laughs> I needed to earn money for my tuition. And I looked for a paying summer job in some aspect of medicine. But what job? I applied for an anesthesia externship. Externs would be preceptees, learn the trade, and be paid to take call for their preceptors. <laughs> Yikes. None of us knew any more of anesthesia than what we had been taught in the first year course on pharmacology. The audacity and stupidity of that choice makes me tremble today. I arrived for work on a sunny spring day in 1952, dressed for the operating room, and sat at the head of the operating room table on which lay a patient for some minor procedure. Dr. Gittleson inserted a steel needle, no plastic cannulas then, into a vein and infused a dilute solution of thiopental. I was instructed to deliver a combination of oxygen and nitrous oxide to the patient via a black rubber mask. I held on the patient's face, attached to a breathing circuit and a rubber bag. The rubber bag revealed the patient's breathing in its rhythmical contractions and re-expansions with each breath. Dr. Gittleson was called from the room. I was left alone to tend to the patient. The thiopental flowed. The bag rhythmically contracted and expanded, and I tightly held the mask to the patient's face. As seconds passed, the bag moved less and less. It eventually stopped moving altogether. I knew little of anesthesia, or medicine for that matter, but I did know that breathing was good and not breathing was bad. The circulating nurse fetched Dr. Gittleson. When he returned, he pointed out that I could have compressed the bag to breathe for the patient. It goes both ways, you see. The rest of the day passed uneventfully. At the end of the day, I sat in the locker room, slowly dressing, stinking with the sweat of the terror that had stayed with me throughout the day. I thought, you could have killed that patient today. And if you decide on a career in anesthesia, you could do that every day. <laughs> every day, take a patient's life in your hands. Every day. That was a life-changing epiphany. epiphany. Anesthesia is power. This was like offering candy to a child. I took it. My career was thus shaped by two epiphanies a decade apart. I didn't want to be a shoe salesman, and I wanted to be an anesthesiologist. 
But there is one more reason. At age six, I had repeated upper respiratory tract infections. My pediatrician prescribed a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, duly carried out under ether anesthesia. I also received ether for anesthesia after an accident at age 10. For the induction of both anesthetics, I was restrained, forced to breathe ether from a face mask. The pungency of the ether made breathing difficult. Superimposed on my sense of strangulation, a black vortex drew me down into a crescendo of buzzing as consciousness disappeared. Each of these two terrifying experiences lasted only moments, but they were moments I never wanted to experience again. By becoming an anesthesiologist, I might be able to preclude that possibility by finding an easier way to induce and maintain anesthesia. You know the next chapters. Internship and residency, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, being John Severinghouse's fellow at UCSF. The evolution of MAC, the evolution of pharmacokinetics. Ted also liked to walk in the mountains. He was quite a hiker. His work on new inhaled anesthetics, his work on anesthetics in the mind, and his last 15 years devoted to MAC and theories of narcosis. So I won't share with this audience, which certainly knows it, his extensive list of scientific contributions. But we then come to the epilogue of his autobiography. My research with numerous collaborators has led to over 500 peer-reviewed publications, including nine of 100 citation classics. The co-authors on these publications included fellows who subsequently became two medical school deans, four ASA Distinguished Service awardees, four ASA Excellence in Research awardees, and 24 department chairs. They included the editors-in-chief of anesthesiology and anesthesia and analgesia, and nine American Board of Anesthesiology directors following their fellowship my fellows published over 1,600 of their own papers. I was asked to speak at Harvard, accepted with the understanding that I would speak on the history of anesthesia and would do so in the ether dome. In 1997, I did just that with my daughter, Renee, wife, Lynn Spittler, and author, Julie Fenster, who had written a book on Morton's demonstration. I stood where Morton had stood more than 150 years earlier in this great moment, captured by Dr. Foreman. <laughs> So uh, this concludes what I'm going to read from Ted, but I will say that uh, on July 14th, Pamela and I took Ted and Lynn to see Hamilton. And I just love this picture. This was taken a week before he received his diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. You can see Pamela reaching over there and tickling him and him obviously enjoying the attention. <laughs> um, and those of you who have seen Hamilton, fantastic. Uh, will know how it ends. And for me, this is very personal and poignant, um, as his autobiography is not finished, but hopefully will be completed and published on Amazon within a month. Uh, and the conclusion of uh, Hamilton is the question, are the questions, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? Thank you.